Jesus said, I came. You want to know why I came? People don't know this. I came so that you can have the ultimate life. I came that you can have life abundantly. Someone say abundantly. abundantly. Some say life, uh, uh, life to the fullest. Jesus, most people don't equate Jesus and life. That's what he's like. I came that you can have the fullest life and you can have the abundant life. I came that you can have the ultimate life. And he uh, gives us a sequence of what it takes to get on track with him to explore this life. And so that's what our series is about. The first, uh, the first one we looked at last week, which was cool. If you missed it, you can go back. Um, but it's called, it was called the, 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 the directions to an ultimate life start with the way, that there actually is a way. Jesus, and by the way, the way is a person. Maybe turn that down just a notch, the volume. Um, the way is a person. The way is a person. And that person is Jesus who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he goes, and no one gets to the Father but through me. So there's a definitive way, absolute way. And Jesus said he is the way. He did not say he is a way. That's profound because many, like, well, there's many roads, there's many pathways. Well, says who? Who said there's many pathways? Think about it. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so that's a pretty absolute statement. Um, and by the way, when people think about many roads, um, many roads and many pathways, if you look at, and I encourage people who, who explore world religions and have different persuasions, um, I encourage them to look at the source material of every faith, the source material, their oldest scriptures, their oldest things. Not, none of them are older than the Bible, but even if you did look at them, you're going to see the idea of life and the purpose of life and coming back a bunch of time, none of those are the same source. They're different sources. So it's not like we all are on the same road with the same creator out there. It's kind of like you better figure your source material because this one is saying you come back and you do it a million times to get your life right and you don't know where you left off and you don't really know what you have to fix. It just didn't work last time. So you're going to keep coming back again and again. It's almost like a vicious cycle, like a loop, like you're stuck in a loop and you never know where you left off and you never know what you need to fix. There's that one and then there's, there's other ones over here. You just go into nothingness or, some, or if you find the right zone, you're just in bliss and then non-existent. And, and the Bible is telling us that God has life for us here with his spirit in you to give you peace and joy and patience and kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control, to do all these cool things in your life and then also have eternal life. So it's the ultimate life here and later. It's prosperity on the inside and prosperity eternally. And today we're looking at if that's the case, if there is a way, how do I know that I'm on the way? H how do I know that I'm not getting off the way? Uh, what do I use to test the way? Because the way is obviously the, a direction to an ultimate life, but what is my distinction? How will I know if I'm on, if I'm off? I mean, day to day, week to week, year to year. How do I even know I'm on the way? And that's what we're going to um, do today. We're going to talk about the directions. Now, when I say directions, a lot of guys squirm a little bit because guys, face it, guys, we don't ask for directions, do we? Come on. Do we ask for directions? Oh, honey, pull over. I want to ask this guy for directions. No, you don't. You're like, I'm not asking. I'll figure it out. And many of you have experienced this. And driving around the block some extra times until you figure it out. Wasting time, but I'm not asking anybody. I'm going to figure it out. Thank God for Google Maps. Because now we don't have to ask for directions. I mean, for so many guys, that's like a lifesaver, right? I don't have to ever ask anyone for directions. Something about us, I don't know what it is. The women are like, just pull over and ask somebody. What's the big deal? No, won't do it. Um, but anyway, thank God for Google Maps. Uh, how many of you know that God wants you to ask for directions? He actually wants you to ask for directions. And the Bible is loaded with direction. He gives clear direction of the greatest blessings. And this is how you can know for sure because God literally told you. God told us things. God gave us revelation. He gave us deep insight. So when it comes to the direction and the way, there is more clarity than most people know. And I have to just tell you, this topic really fires me up because this topic changed my life. The idea that there's a God and, and that, he, that, that he's out there and that he loves us and has a plan, that's one level. That's one level, and that's important. The idea that he's got revelation and insight and distinction, somebody say distinction, that he has distinction for your life, 
Really? Yes, unequivocally, really. And this is where it gets really good, is on the distinction part. Um, his word is so rich, and we're going to look at the distinction in his word. And I'm, my prayer today, guys, is this. Many of you know, this is a 3,500-year-old document, the Bible, Old Testament, and then the New Testament's 2,000 years old. We've got thousands of manuscripts found from ancient times, and they all corroborate to the integrity of the word you have today. If anyone tells you people made stuff up in here, they just didn't check their history. They did not check their history. If you look at the amount of manuscripts found and the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything else we found in uh, Masoretic texts and there's uh, uh, all texts everywhere, Sinai, uh, there's Alexandria, there's texts all over the place that we have. They all corroborate with what you have today. This is accurate. This is valid. It doesn't mean that you believe in the spiritual truth of it. People are entitled to that view. But is it accurate and ancient? Unequivocally it is. And it is the most accurate ancient document on the planet. There's nothing even close to the amount of source material, ancient stuff found, put together in this. Um, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they find, you know, the complete book of Isaiah. Up in Masada, they find the book of Isaiah. Exactly, exactly what you have. I mean, this is some ancient corroboration. So the point is this. God gave us this profound revelation. And I just want to tell you, some people say the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is basic instructions before leaving earth. Uh, you might have heard that before. Believe me, it is rich. It is rich. It is rich. And if you don't have this as a central part of your life, not out of a religious thing, out of a disclosure thing. Somebody say disclosure. There's truckloads of disclosure. And why would we miss it? Why would we be like, no, that's cool. I don't, I don't want disclosure. Then you're like the guys who won't ask for directions and go, I'll figure it out. And you find yourself in a loop. You find yourself going around and around because you're not asking for directions. But the sooner you go, okay, God, if you got direction, bring in my way. I'm all ears. If you really have direction. And this is where it starts. Um, Jesus said this in John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Now, this word is true. And that's why it's a reliable source book for your direction and for where you're going in life. This, this word is true. First point this morning, we got a, a few quick ones. I encourage you to write these down. But the first one, or put them in your notes or whatever. Uh, but the first one is the word is the map for all directions in life. All directions in life. You want to launch a business? Check the word. It's going to tell you who to partner with. It's going to tell you about debt. It's going to tell you about leverage and risk. It's going to tell you about what bears fruit and what doesn't. Oh, yeah, even that's in there. What about a relationship? I'm going to get, want to get married. I'm a, that's in there, too. Really? Oh, yeah. What Friendships, that's in there, too. What bears fruit? What, what blesses us in life? And what actually comes back to bother us later on? It's all in there. All this stuff is in the Word. And a lot of people are not getting into it for that. They haven't, they haven't seen it for what it is. And when you begin to see this for what it is, I'm telling you, it's a straight game changer. It's a real game changer. Um, so it is a, a word map. God says he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. So you have what you need. You're not lacking. There is revelation and insight right in front of everyone. Many of you have uh, the Bible app. If you don't have the Bible app, download the Bible app, okay? It's like the most downloaded app probably in the world. And it's, um, you know, you can, you can, if you're busy and you're on your way to work or something like that, uh, it, it'll give you the verse of the day at least, uh, but, but you can go through chapters and while you're driving through your Bluetooth or whatever, you just hit play and it will play a chapter as you're driving. If you don't even have time to read it, be in the Word. I'm telling you, you will be so transformed. Um, but this is how we test everything. See, when stuff comes up in my life, a lot of times we're not sure. There's opportunities or maybe distractions, and this helps you test. Somebody say test. You got to test things, guys. You have to test things. And if you don't test things, you, we're just kind of winging it. And the Bible gives us tests so we can test things, whether they're blessable, whether, whether these are things that will level you up or not. Is this an upgrade in my life or a downgrade? The Word will help you test it. Um, whether I'm on the right path or the wrong path. Is it from God or not from God? Is it true or not? Is this the way or not the way? It's all in there. Psalm 119, 105 says this one. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, 
the word of God literally, this is even Old Testament, is like you're walking through the dark and you're walking through a forest and the word just poof, lights the path like some big old like LED light. It's like literally, you're, you're not going to stumble. If you're in the word, you won't stumble. People around you, can you turn that down just a little bit, Kate? I'm just getting a little ring out of this. Um, people around you will stumble. People around you are going to. Why? Because they just don't have the direction you do. And this is going to light your path, and this is really integral. But my road is clear. My way is clear. It doesn't mean that we're perfect the way we walk it out. It doesn't mean that. It just means the path is clear, and we got revelation and insight to it. Now, here's the thing about uh, the devil. The devil does not want you on the path. The devil doesn't want you on the path. And the devil will do anything he can to divert you on the path. Anything, anything at all to divert you. And he's been diverting people for thousands of years. He's really good at diversion. Um, so you've probably seen the movie scene before where they're going down the road and all of a sudden a truck pulls up, some utility truck. And all of a sudden they put out the cones and they put out the road blockers and they send everyone down a different street, right? You've seen this before, right? Yeah. That kind of diversion, that's exactly what, and while that's happening, there's like a bank robbery going on, and everyone's like, oh, I'm just driving to work, right? Um, even the cops are going the wrong way. You know? uh, the devil is the same way. He's div he wants to divert traffic. He wants to divert you. He wants to divert you off the way. He's been doing it for years. Anything he can do to divert, he will do it. Again, we said last week, the devil doesn't need people to be uh, w devil worshipers. He just wants us diverted and off the mark. And he's hilariously happy. He's been doing it successfully. Um, this is important because um, we get these ideas and these influences. And guess what? We don't test them. And then we get diverted. I get diverted, you get diverted. It happens very easy. The devil knows it. Like, oh, this is cool. Let me send this little diversion. Yes, they bit it. They're going after it. They're thinking, they're stewing on the diversion. Now just watch what happens. And he sits back and goes, sure enough, look, they're getting diverted right now. And so diversion is critical. This is what it says in Colossians 2.8. This is important. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive, captive, through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Someone say philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Um, this is saying that there's so many worldly philosophies, even back then in the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago, so many philosophies. Now, these philosophies are mindsets. They're mindsets, they're worldviews, and there are plenty of worldviews in our time. There are plenty of philosophies in our time. Everyone, the Bible says in the end days, everyone will do what is right in their own eyes. Like, I got my truth and my philosophy. Oh, that's cool. Here's mine, and here's mine, and here's mine, and here's mine. And we got a ton of philosophies. We got a ton of worldviews. Everyone's doing their own thing, doing their own thing. And, and, and that's, that's common. That's what it says. But the Bible says, can I tell you something about these philosophies? They're not based on me. Here's the problem. They're based on human tradition and know what they do. They're, they're based on principles of the world rather than God's. And what they do, whether people know it or not, they take them captive. The philosophy, the philosophy ends up, and the tradition that we start to stew on and embrace takes so many people captive, and, and, and they're, they're not living a liberated life. Now, they might think they are until they find out that they're not, but the Bible's saying over and over again, people get um, captivated by these things. Um, God says that these man-made traditions, this is what he says, it says they're hollow and empty. Hollow and empty. Now, if you're like me, you have to maybe go down this road a little bit to realize it's hollow and empty. Has anybody ever gone down the road with a philosophy in their life? You're going down a road, you think it's good, you're like, hey, it's my way, it's the way I'm going to do my life. And you get down the road and, and eventually you realize, well, I didn't know it at the beginning, but this is definitely hollow and empty. Is anybody, can I get some honesty in the room with that one? Yeah, that's exactly what happens, and it happens to everyone, but no one's really calling it out. No one's calling it out. And it's saying it's our, it's our worldviews and our philosophies, and we think it's our truth, and we go down the road, and they're deceptive, and they take people captive. You know what it's like? It's like, it's like walking on thin ice, but you don't know it's thin ice. You're like, what? I'm good. It's all good. And you're going down the road doing your thing. It's like, no, it's on thin ice. It's like, it doesn't feel like it. Well, right now it doesn't feel like it. 
You know, thin ice, I don't know if you have experience with thin ice, but when we were uh, kids in New York, I was born in New York, I moved to California when I was 14, but um, when, we were, when we were younger, we looked forward to the winter time because we wanted to play ice hockey. We couldn't wait till ice hockey time. And there was always the glaring question, the biggest question, there was the, the number one issue on the block for everybody, is the ice ready? Is the ice ready? It got cold, it got frozen, what, for one day, two days? Is the ice ready? And everyone's like... I don't know, maybe. Is the ice ready? Who's going to try it? Who's going to try it? I don't know. Did you try it? No, you try it. So we had two ponds. We had a local pond near us. It wasn't that big. It was about, it was maybe the size of this room. Maybe. Maybe not. But that's all we had as little kids. That was the close pond. And we had a big pond about a mile and a half, two miles away. That was like a football field, like a couple miles away. But the little pond, I remember being there one time, and they're like, is it ready? I don't know, is it ready? And the, all the big kids were there, and I was there, and they're like, uh, you're going to try it out? And they go, no, Brian, you try it. I go, me? Why me? And they said, because you're lighter than us. And I said, all right, I'm not afraid. So sure enough, I go out on this ice, and I get out there further and further and further, and with no warning, up, up to my leg. My body is out, and one leg's out, and my foot is completely in. I'm looking, and they're afraid to come over to me because they don't want to fall in. I'm like, what friends are you guys, right? So they finally put out a stick, and I get out of there, and I'm like, my heart's going like this. I'm like, that was a dumb idea. Who's going to test the ice, right? Um, but, but later on, when we'd go to the big pond, we'd wait till it's frozen for at least a week or so because everybody was, this is a big pond. And on that one, we're like, is the ice thick enough? You don't want to be playing ice hockey on thin ice. So what we did on that one, since that was going to be a lot of people, we needed a lot of volunteers. And everybody would grab like a log. And we'd go out there, and we'd throw it and see if anything happens. And we'd go out further, and people would start throwing these logs. And at some, because we didn't know if the ice was six inches or two, we had no idea. But eventually, if everybody got to throw a log everywhere, there's no cracks or anything... We're playing ice hockey, and it's on. Um, but the moral of the story, guys, you don't want to be skating on thin ice. You don't want to be living on thin ice. You don't want your philosophies and your mindset and your worldview. I don't care what it is. It's, it might sound so well-intended. It might sound brilliant. I saw it on TikTok, and it works. Look, it's so cool. And, you know, you're going down the road. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's not founded on the principles of Christ... It's, it's thin ice. We're just kind of winging it, and it takes people captive. Um, and the thing about this is some people, when it comes to building their lives, some people about these ideas and philosophies, and I know because I was one of them. I'm just going to be honest and transparent. We, we believe stuff sometimes so strongly. We have our own view so strongly. Our view is unshakable. You guys do what you want, but I'm very unshakable about my view. And you go down the road, and, and then just because you believe strongly about something, it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true just because... Now, if I believe there's a little kid walking out there, this ice is two feet thick. I believe it. That's my truth. Well, that's fine, Brian, but it's not. It doesn't matter. I believe it. And I'm still falling in, Right? I'm still falling in. Just because you believe it doesn't make it true. Here, here's the big paradox, guys, about what's true and what's not. Belief, listen, belief does not determine truth. Truth should determine your belief. But belief does not determine truth. And there are people going, living their life, and they're living hard, foot to the floor, with a belief, with a philosophy, with an idea, with their my truth, and their my persuasion, and human tradition, and a deceptive philosophies. And there's a million of them out there, and it's, it's my truth, so I'm going to believe it. It's like, that's kind of reckless, because just because you believe it does not make it true. But if it is true, it'd be really wise to believe it. Amen? It'd be really wise to believe it. Don't be like me. Don't fall in the ice when you don't have to. Don't fall in if you don't have to. If you stand on truth, you won't be falling into anything. And if you don't stand on truth, we're all capable of falling into everything. So belief, second point, does not determine truth, but truth should determine uh, belief. Uh, Jesus says, the word is truth. And if you're in truth, you're in truth. And here's how powerful it is in Hebrews 4, 12. And this, this really, um, when I read this, you know, at a first read, you might go, what is this talking about? But here's, here's the gold, guys. Um, this passage here, some of you in the room, and it's no, no judgment, just, just an observation of 
growing with God, waking up to the love and the power of God, and getting in on the kingdom of God. As you start going, you learn more things, you discover more things, you see more things. This passage here is a clear reality of what you do or don't see, specifically with this Bible. For some of you, you're like, yeah, I don't know, that's some ancient thing, and I don't understand it. Listen, if it's hard for you to read, get, a, get an easy version. Start with something easy. Start with the Living Translation, right? Living Translation, Living Bible. Start with an uh, NIV. Start by listening to it on your Bible app in plain old English. Nothing, no, no Shakespeare. You don't have to listen to Shakespeare. If you don't like Shakespeare, don't listen to the Shakespeare version, okay? Jesus didn't speak Shakespeare. You know Jesus didn't speak Shakespeare? Uh, you, you get the version that you can. These are all sound uh, Bibles today. The, uh, the main, all our main Bibles are very sound. But, but here's the thing. For some people... It's something that, you know, I guess you read it. I guess you're supposed to read it. And other people are like, oh, no, this is a thing. This, this, this takes on a life form. And other people are like, life form? What are you talking about? It's an old book. It's ink on a page. And other people are like, oh, no, it's so much more than that. And I'm saying that before we read this passage because there's some of you in the room where this book is just an old book, and maybe you are supposed to read it, and maybe it has some cool stuff in it, and to others, you're like, oh, no, this thing is so much more than a book. This has gotten personal, and it's taken on a life form. Here's a passage that ex explains the life form of the word, and your roadmap, what I'm trying to tell you guys, your roadmap is alive. Your roadmap is alive. Your roadmap is not like some map you get at 7-Eleven, like whatever, a map, paper map when you're camping or something like that where there's no GPS. No, your map is alive. Did you know your map was alive? Because when you know your map is alive, you're like, wow, this is legitimate. It's actually speaking to me. Things are coming off the page on the map and personal to me in my life. This is not fabrication. This is a 2,000-year-old promise. It's a promise, and many of you have experienced this promise. Here it is, Hebrews uh, 4, verse 12. It says, the Word of God. Somebody say the Word of God. It's living and active. Living and active what? What? The Word of God is living and active? I don't know about that. I haven't experienced that. Others are like, oh, I have. I have. And so my prayer today, if we go no further, is that some of you in this room would go, wait a minute, if the Word is actually living and active, I have not experienced that. But I want to. I want to. And for the rest of you, you take it at heart value. If that's true, I'm going to own that. I'm going to live that. I'm going to take advantage of that. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing. Listen how good it divides. Soul and spirit joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This is, this is how good it is. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. That's good. We're good at that part. Um, so here's the thing about the Word of God. The Word of God divides between bone and marrow. And again, not to get overly graphic, but if you've had a piece of chicken and you pull off a drumstick, which we've all ripped off a drumstick sometimes. Some of you fought over the drumstick. Uh, but anyway, when you pull off the drumstick, at the end, you see the end of the bone's got the white on there, Right? It's like the, 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 the end of the marrow. And if you were to try to cut that off with a knife, good luck. You'd probably need a razor blade. And it's going to be very hard to separate the bone from, from that sort of thing. But guess what? The Word of God completely separates that kind of stuff in our life. You're like, well, how can the Word of God do it? Because I can't even do it. I can't even separate my thought from my feeling from my this. You ever struggle with your thought, your feeling, your this, that, like what category it is? I think we all do. Guess what? That's okay. That's common. That's natural to struggle with that. The Word of God separates it for you. What I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I should do, I don't know. I'm struggling. I'm wondering. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm trying to get my path down in life and my direction, and I'm pulled in different ways, and I'm feeling really strongly about this, but I also am really like that, and I don't really know. Well, the Word of God separates between bone and marrow, and it separates thoughts and motives and intentions, and here's the golden thing. It also, and by the way, when it says it's alive, can I just tell you something? This is the only book on planet Earth that is alive. Somebody say the only one. There's nothing else alive. There is nothing else alive on the planet in print form than the Word of God. Um, 
The word of God is alive because the Bible says it's spirit breathed, that the spirit of God told people to wrote the scripture and it all corroborates 66 books written on three different continents over a 1500 year period. It all corroborates. There's no other religious writing even remotely close to that. Not, not, even, not even remotely close to that. Um, and, and so it's, it's spirit breathed and the word of God is alive. But here's the thing, and this is our third point this morning. Uh, it's alive. And if it hasn't come alive to you, please, please read it until it does. If it hasn't come alive to you yet, because some people it hasn't, and that's okay. If it hasn't come alive, read it till it does. I remember in my life, I was a new believer. I wasn't raised as a Christian. I had a Catholic background, never read a Bible in my life. But when I started to go to a Christian church, and they're like, well, Somebody get me an easy to read Bible, like a living translation. And honestly, it was super simple. It was great for me. It was like, I can read it like nothing. It's like simple. I, I understood it. I love it. Great way to start. And I'm reading the Bible because you're supposed to. Everyone said you're supposed to. You should read it, right? I'm like, okay, I'm reading it because I should. And I remember one day I was sitting reading the Bible because you should. Somebody say, because you should. And as I'm reading the Bible because I should... I'm sitting there reading it, just going like, hey, before I go to bed, I should read the Bible. And as I'm reading the Bible, I was in the book of Psalms, I'm reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, I sensed, what is going on right now? I sensed the presence of God in the room in such a compelling way, and, and literally, and not, I mean, from my perception, because the Spirit of God can show you and reveal things. Remember I said it's alive? I didn't know it was alive, but it came alive to me that night. And if you've ever seen a 60-minute show where they're showing, like, uh, who did this and who did that, and they're showing you documents on the screen, 60 minutes, it blurs the entire document except for the yellow highlight. You know how it does that and brings it to you? Have you ever seen those shows where they do that? That's what happened to the Word. All of a sudden, a section of Scripture is kind of lighting up and, like, not, not coming off the page. You're like, is Pastor Kooky? What's up with this thing? No, it's doing what it says it should do. It's doing what it said it would do. It would be alive and living. And I'm sitting there going, what is happening to me? I like pinch my, like, what is going on? And God was just showing me, it's alive. Somebody say it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. And if it's alive, why wouldn't you be in it? Why wouldn't you embrace it? Why wouldn't it be central to your life? You need a roadmap, guys. Yours is alive if you choose to use it. And so that, to me, rocked my world completely. And, and so it also says, guys, it separates between bone and marrow and thoughts and feelings and motives and intentions. And you're like, my goodness, I can't do that myself. I can't, I can't separate my thoughts and feelings. And like, is it in this category? I don't really know. Is it, you know what I mean? And feelings come and go, and you don't want to be making all your decisions on feelings, and then you're so off track. You want to make them on convictions, amen? Feelings are cool, but convictions got to be like, no, this is core. This is, this is who I am. This is where I'm going. Otherwise, our feelings are going to take us in circles. Um, so um, the thing about the word, guys, Listen, last point, the Word of God clarifies and cures, clarifies and cures the deepest issues of the heart and soul. The deepest things we have, it says it does that for us. It, it separates between spirit and soul, and it shows us, and it reveals, and it discloses. Uh, it is alive, um, and, and it clarifies and cures the deepest issues. Um, listen to this, if there's last little idea right here. It separates spirit from soul. Everybody say spirit and soul. I wish the human race really understood this, but the spirit, according to what God says he does in the Bible, is the eternal aspect of you. And when you're made new in Jesus, behold, I make all things new. You're born of water. You're born of spirit. You're a new creation, the Bible says. New creation in Christ Jesus. New, somebody say new creation. Okay, the spirit is who you really are. Say who I really am. Soul is what I think and I feel in my emotions. Put some soul into it. Put some emotion in it. Put some feeling into it. Some people get angry. Oh, their soul was a little agitated. Some people are how oh, their soul is how. The soul can be all over with our emotions and stuff like that, right? Mind, will, and emotions. We could be all over the map. The spirit is core identity. It's who God says you are. You know what the word of God does? It can separate who you really are, listen, 
from all these ideas we have floating around in worldviews and perceptions and things that come and go. And they're all real. We have them. It's, not, it's, it's, it's part of the design. But the Word of God, sometimes you need to separate them because you need to make decisions that you're going to level up in life and you can't get stuck over in this circle. You need to be, what is, who am I, God? Who did you make me to be? I want to be who you want me to be and I don't want distraction. And I get in the Word and your Word separates my mind, will, and emotions, the soul, the thoughts, the attitudes, the human human traditions, all the concepts, the hollow things, all that stuff, you expose it and you give me clarity on who I am and who you're calling to be. That's why we got to be in the Word. There's nothing else on the planet that can do that for you. There's nothing else on the planet that will really do that for you, not even a therapy session or a counselor, unless they too are deeply in this. And they'll hopefully tell you what it is, but I guarantee you, you sit alone with God in this. You're going to get disclosure and revelation and insight for days. Again, if the word hasn't come alive to you, family, please, 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 I'm imploring you, read it until it does. Somebody say, read it until it does. It will. It'll come alive to you. God promises it will. And I can't tell you how many things he showed me. And that's why some people have, have realized, you know what? It's so alive. I'm going to start my day. Before I turn on the, my, you know, whatever, the uh, radio or my feed or so check my social or do whatever I'm going to do, before I do that, before I, you know, jump on my playlist, whatever, before I do that, Give us our daily bread. I'm going to actually get into your word this morning, God. Before I even chart my course, before I do my day, I know it's a discipline, but I'm encouraging you to not just be a believer, but be a disciplined follower. Amen? And as a disciplined follower, you get in the word in the morning. If you can only do a verse or a chapter or a, a paragraph, whatever you, wherever you start. Um, but you start with the word and you start sitting with God. And when you get this word in you in the morning, it's going to inform, listen, the word of God is going to inform the rest of your day. You stick it at the end, and that's nice before you go to bed. It's a good way to go to bed. But you start in the morning. It's going to inform your day. You know what you're going to do? You're going to be able to test. Somebody say test. All the ideas and philosophies and thoughts and worldviews and all the persuasions and everything around there that everybody feels so strongly. You're going to test all of it, even your own. And you're going to go, this is who I am. This is who God's calling me to be. God, you got my attention. I'm on the path. I'm on the path. I'm on my direction. And so on that note, I want to close in prayer this morning. If you guys would stand and join me in prayer, that would be great. Um, yeah. Um, Lord, I thank you for everybody here. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for what you want to do in our lives, God. You don't want us to exist. You want us to thrive. Um, you don't want us to just get through life. You want us to have the abundant life. You want us to, uh, you said you came that we might have life to the fullest. We might have it abundantly. And uh, Lord, you gave us resources. You gave us rich resources. And one of the best ones is this roadmap of directions in the Word of God that is alive, and it is so alive, you're trying to show us how alive it is because you're going to help us level up and get in on things. You give us everything we need for life and godliness. You give us, you give us instruction about our relationships, about our success, about our design, about our future, about how to actually have joy in life and where it really comes from, and, and Lord, what faith can do if we partner and agree with you, and just so many things, God. And so, Lord, we just don't want to believe from a distance. We want to participate in this abundant life, in this ultimate life. So I pray all of us in this room, God, as we sit down with you this week and crack open your word um, and, and spend some time with you, uh, God, I pray that you reward those who seek you and your word would begin to come alive in new and exciting ways. I also pray if anyone here wants to receive you, maybe believes in you from a distance, but knows that, you know what, God's trying to get my attention, and he's trying to wake me up, and he's calling me into a commitment, and I think it's time. It's time. I, I, I can't run from God. I can't keep him at a distance. He loves me too much, and he's been pursuing me too long. It's time. And if that's the case, if that's you, just in the privacy of your own heart, say, you know what, God, I'm sorry for running, but right now, today, I choose to turn and follow. I'm going to turn and follow you. I believe, Jesus, you died on a cross and rose from the grave. I ask, Lord, that you put your spirit in me. Begin to lead me also from the inside. Show me in your word. Help me walk in your ways. Give me victory. Give me power. Show me how to live. I want to live your way. I want to go your way. I want to turn from mine and go your way. 
We thank you for that, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? All right. Um, if you, uh, if you said that prayer, see us after the service or connect with us online. We want to help you with some first steps. In the meantime, guys, come to the midweek stuff. That's where it gets really good, the midweek stuff, men's and women's studies, stuff like that, uh, and youth night.